Hi, everybody. Welcome into another edition, a brand new episode, the first of four brand new episodes, courtesy delivered to you by Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. And hey, be sure to subscribe and leave a review and watch the show on YouTube as well. The Lab Epstein Hitting Podcast page, you can subscribe there and watch the show as well. Episode 142, a topic that we're revisiting. And this is a topic for those new listeners and viewers that we did way back when in 2020 we started the show in april of 2020 a long time ago that was when COVID 19 shut the world down and i can tell you side note i was thinking about this today if COVID 19 didn't end the world as i sit here in 2023 i'm thinking ai will but nonetheless episode 142 we're talking about data and we talked about data very in depth in episode eight way back when in 2020 and here we are in 2023 we're updating our information library and discussing data how it can be applied for both coaches and players professionally baseball and softball so let me bring in professional evaluator successful business owner my former coach current day renowned coach we've been doing this together for a long time friend and co-host and he was my hitting instructor of course jake epstein what's going on my friend not too much man this is uh yeah it's a good topic because there's new technology, right? There's there's yeah. other technology that people are using, and people now have used it for a few years, right? And they they kind of figure out, well, what do I use and what do I not? What what part of that piece of equipment is useful? What part of the data is useful and what's not? What can we throw out? So hopefully we can help you filter through some of that. Yeah, we're going to be discussing a couple of points today, the data thought process, paralysis by analysis, which in 2023, it's no different from 2020 or 2015. And even going back further, when you're trying to hit a baseball or softball paralysis by analysis, I do want to touch on something, though. Last couple of weeks, we discussed requirements of a successful hitting coach. We did it in episode 139, episode 141 sandwiched in there was a mechanical breakdown of Jeff McNeil. So go back to the archive and listen to those episodes. But when it comes to requirements of a successful hitting coach, and you've been talking about this now, I've noticed for like a month, you've kind of snuck it in to each show where you've said how you're updating your blueprint for coaching. And you're going to be working on that this summer. How do coaches go about, first of all, number one, younger coaches, how do they create a blueprint? What are the, what are the pillars that they need to know to create that blueprint? And how can coaches and even players go about updating their hitting blueprint as they move forward. Well, that's why we're putting something together. And it's because there's so much information out there. There's there's so much information you can dive into on social media or YouTube, uh, books. So it's like, where, where do I start? You know, where do I start with this team of eight-year-olds? You know, do I start with fundamentals of grip and stance? Do I start with... Uh, maybe something mechanical. Do we start with uh, rhythm and timing? Um, do, do we start defensively with footwork or do I just get them to start on their knees where we're just trying to catch the ball and get it out of our glove and funnel the right way? So we're trying to put something together that just simplifies the process for, for coaches. Um, and it, it's different depending on the kid, quite honestly. Um, I actually did a lesson today with some some new a new family and they had, they had three kids and they're younger, which I I don't always do younger players, but these these players were they're motivated and they they're super athletic. Well, it was the first time I ever gave lessons to someone where the dad called and said, "I remember watching you play when you were in college," so that made me feel extra extra old. Um, now this kid was in like middle school and now I'm working with his kids, so that's always fun. But going through the process, they had an eight-year-old and an eleven-year-old and a thirteen-year-old, and so they all had different things they needed to work on. And so, what's the process there? We could start each one of them on this same thing: do this, do this, do this. But they didn't really need that. You know, one person needed more of weight shift and rhythm, and another player had bad bat drag, and another player had a wrist roll issue. So, you know, we identified those issues, and then I created a plan to attack those. So, and then they have to do that on their own. They have to find a way to attack that on their own. So um, like my own kid, um, I started with the bat on the shoulder because I did not want her to have bat drag. That was the one thing when we first picked up a bat to play this game. I don't care if it's baseball or softball. There's one issue that is the most common and the most detrimental, meaning it causes multiple issues. You know, bat drag causes a barrel dump. It causes 
a swing plate issue and it causes a wrist roll because the, the arms get stuck and we can't extend through. So I didn't want to deal with that. So that was the one thing we started with. I said, put your feet like this, step to here if you want. If you don't, I don't really care, but keep the bat on your shoulder and I want you to turn to the ball. And that's where we started from. And it's been good for, she never had bat drag. Um, you know, we haven't had to worry about that. She's got other issues that we have to work on, you know, extension could be better and creating a little bit more separation be between torsos. But again, we don't treat everyone the same. So, you know, what I'm trying to do is create something where you can identify it. What is, what is the main thing that this player needs? Um, and let's, here's a simple drill to start the process, or you have a team of 12 kids and we don't have time to spend an hour with each one at practice. You get about five minutes with each one at practice. You know, what are the best drills to do in that environment? So, um, you know, that's the big thing. I, I wish there was a, a simple answer to your question of, oh, go here. But that's what I'm trying to create is a place where you can go and, and get players started on the right process. And then you can add in all the crazy information that people talk about with scapulas and inductions and no, I guess that's if someone's pregnant, but anyway, all these fancy terms that people are trying to cre cre create a name for themselves with centrifugal force and, you know, well, you know, the word is. induction, by the way, that will be a, a term in 2024 on yeah. anywhere. So you just created a new term. Yeah, somebody's great. going to steal. Yeah. It. Someone's going to go into labor quicker. That's yeah. what that is. So yeah, it's, it's, you know, let's start with the basics and then build up and then, you know, you can start doing some, extra things with your hands or extra things with your elbows or extra things with your load. But none of that works. If you're a 10 year old player with bat drag and you try to do all this stuff that people are talking about on the internet, um, you're going to fail. You're going to fail miserably. So you have to have that foundation before you kind of move to that next level. And but that's, you know, you're, that's what's hard to find. But your father created that foundation for you, passed it on to you. And you mentioned part of that foundation in there with the bat on the shoulder. Yeah. And you did that with me. Yeah. And you've done that. You do that with pretty much all your students. Yeah. But you, everyone. but that foundation that your father created, he took those older methods that Ted Williams taught him mm -hmm. and signed off on. And then he passed them, your father, onto you, those new methods or those older methods. And you created some new methods to blend with the older methods together. And that's where coaches, I think, run into some hitting coaches, run into some trouble in trying to evolve as coaches. They can't blend the two because they don't have that proper foundation like you did. And you just displayed that proper example right there. You have to have the foundation, right? You can't you can't build a house on bad footing. So you have to have the foundation first, but then you also have to have the ability to to learn more and digest. Again, this is what I do. Yeah, and this is this is what I do. I don't go, and I'm not a firefighter, and I, I don't go to the the firehouse and save lives and put out fires all day, and then try to research how to hit a baseball. You know, I'm able to spend and talk to people that play at the very highest level, people that coach at the very highest level. What do they want? What works? I can sit and study video of what pitchers are trying to do to certain hitters. I, And then, you know, obviously I'm giving lessons, so I'm, I'm kind of in the trenches with kids from ages, you know, 10 to, to whatever, 25, you know, or we'll say college kids, 20, 23. So then you have that mix of, okay, I have information, but then I have to apply it. And every player that I've worked with, you including, Jim, I've had to learn something. You know, every player has taught me something. Oh, maybe if a player does this, I shouldn't do this with them. Like I shouldn't work on this until, you know, I fix their top hand or whatever it might be. So, you know, being passionate about learning and, and helping people. Yeah, that's the big thing. But like I said, not everybody has all day to do that and has time to do that. And so that's why I'm fortunate to, to be, in a position where I can spend time learning and continuing to learn and evolve and find better ways. We're, we're still trying to do the same things. You know, Ted Williams said, hips lead the hands, stay inside the ball and swing level to the pitch. Like those are the three things that he said that my dad ran with. Okay. So now we're trying to find ways. I'm trying to find easier ways to do those three moves, easier ways to get a player to stay inside the ball easier ways to get a player to stay on playing with the pitch. Now, most people don't swing down too much. They swing up too much, but we're still trying to get on playing with the pitch. And now we know exactly what the pitch is coming down at. Now we know exactly what the spin rate of that pitch is, how much it's sinking, you know, what kind of X and Y and Z axis it's, it's crossing as it's coming to us. But again, we're still trying to get on playing with that pitch. So the foundation will never change. It's, you know, finding, finding different cheats and different methods and feels to get a player, which they're all different, to 
get on point with that pitch. Some people, and we've talked about this, some people I say, I say keep the barrel above your hand, swing down. And some people I say, you got to sit down and swing up. And those same people see me every week. So it's not like it's few, everyone is different. Everyone needs a different way to get on the plane with that pitch. Well, what do you always talk about when hitters are struggling? You know, we sometimes we'll highlight major league hitters on this show who are doing really, really well. And then we'll talk about hitters who are really, really good, who've put up really good career numbers who are not. What do you always say? They're not on plane with the pitch or their swing plane is off. Something is wrong. Maybe they're not staying inside the ball, but a lot of times it circles back to them not being on plane with the pitch. That's part of your foundation as an instructor. Yeah, and everyone gets on plane at some point. It's mm -hmm. how long are you on plane? Are you on plane for four inches, one ball? Are you on plane for four balls? That'd be mm -hmm. pretty good. Okay, five balls, you know, 15, 16, 17 inches, 20 inches. Yeah, totally possible. Um, so if you have a big window to, to to make mistakes in, if you're on plane for, for that long, say a foot, say two feet, yeah. Then if I'm late or if I'm early, I'm fine. I'm still going to make contact. But if you're only on plane for four or five inches, then what happens is your timing has to be impeccable. And this game is too hard to have absolutely perfect timing, you know, 100% of the time. So it gives us room for error. So that's why it's always, you know, the, the things that I look at first if a player is struggling. Now, if it's a player that I've worked with for a long time and I know they have a pretty good swing plane, it, I usually look, what are they moving? You know, are they moving too late? Are they moving too early? Are they moving too fast? Are they moving too slow? You know, to get to the pitch, right? Their rhythm. But I'll also secondary look, when are they, when is their barrel leaving the, the, the pitch plane? And usually it's a combination of them rushing, um, striding a little bit late and a little bit fast, and then it has them finishing a little bit too high with their fall. So everybody talks about uh, finish high, right? Finish high, finish high, finish high. Sometimes that's good for some players, but sometimes it's terrible for most players. And what happens is they finish high and every ball they hit out in front by their front toes, they top. They swing over, they create top spin. So if you look at players, not all of them finish high. Usually players that chop down, if they drop their hands, then they'll try to yank their hands up. They drop their hands through the hitting zone and then they try to yank them up to a high finish. And that's the high finish isn't the root of the problem. The root of the problem is when they launch their swing. So a high finish doesn't work for everyone. Just look at Juan Soto. He's a very low follow-through guy. Uh, Carlos Beltran comes to mind was a very low follow-through guy. Chase Utley was like a no follow-through guy. Um, you know, not everybody pulls the bat up over their over their ear when they're done. So it's not just a Band-Aid. You know, we, we have to kind of figure out what each player needs to do. And, and a lot of times it's me. I'm telling players to have a lower follow-through so they don't roll over that ball out in front. Well, and, and the things you just mentioned right there all go back to one of my pillars of successful hitting, and that's timing. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, if your timing is off, it doesn't really matter if you finish high or if you finish low, right. there's a good chance you're probably going to roll over. Yeah. Yeah, you're not if, – if you're consistently – and no, most players are either consistently early or consistently late when they go into slumps. And, and that's always the same. It's how we perceive the ball. It has to do with the muscles in the eye and our depth perception and how good our depth perception is. And uh, not everybody, uh, very, very few players have perfect depth perception with an object moving 90 plus mile an hour at us. So we perceive the ball sometimes a little bit further than where it is in, in true life or sometimes a little bit closer than where it is in, in, in real life. So we have to make those adjustments. You know, as athletes, we kind of make those adjustments. Oh, I'm late, late, late. I got to get going a little bit sooner. I got to cheat out in front. So sometimes timing has to do with something physical and sometimes it does have to do with vision. Um, with some players, but you need to know, like for me, I was always early. I was never late. You threw 95, maybe I'd be late. Maybe I'd probably still find a way to pull it foul, but you could just keep going slower and slower and slower. And I had a really hard time letting that ball get to me. And that was probably from the time I was 12 years old to when I was done playing, um, in my twenties. So, um, you have to know that like, okay, I'm usually early. So what do I need to do? I need to see that ball extra deep. I need to think the balls to my front knee before I swing, or yeah. I want to make contact at my front knee. And then normally it'll be right at your front foot. So always be, that's the one thing with, with kids. When, as soon as I start working with them, I always ask them, are you usually early or late? You know, where do your foul balls typically go? Do you pull one ball foul every game? No, I haven't pulled a ball foul in two years. Okay. So you're a late guy. Or, yeah, I pull five or six balls foul a game. Okay, you're an early guy. And then we work with that. Well, 
uh, so I guess the the lesson in all of this requirements going back to last week and a couple of weeks ago, episodes 139, 141, requirements of a successful hitting coach. We talk about fundamentals all day. We can talk about the foundation. We can talk about the blueprint, but you have to be in the trenches to understand these things and to gain an understanding. That's part of gaining what I like to call and Ep hates when I say this, but I'm going to say it anyway, wisdom. What's that? You hate when I say wisdom. You love wisdom. Yeah. I, I don't know. hate when you say wisdom. I you know, you know, a year ago, I said wisdom or something, and you made it fun of me. I just think of a white guy, uh, or not a white guy, but a guy in a big white beard with a, like a pointy hat on top. Yeah, like it's, something out of uh, Harry Potter. Or yeah, kind of a Harry Potter, a wizard. Rings. I keep thinking of a wizard, which reminds me, my first fielder's glove. Hold on now. Hold that first thought for a second. Now, you mentioned wizard wizardry and white people in white uh, cl uh, clothes and hat, like looking like a wizard. Yeah. I just want to say Lord of the Rings, the trilogy or whatever it was, was on a few weeks ago. And I got to tell you, I don't know who could sit through, sit through those movies in 2023. They're like four hours long. Really, I never, I never watched. Never, them. I never watched them. I tried. Yeah, I couldn't do it, them. huh? All right, so you got some kind of glove. Go ahead. Yeah, no. So one of my infielders' mitts as a kid was a Ozzy Smith. Yeah. Uh, model. Yeah, it was one of the cheaper ones that always have their signature in it. So it was a trapeze model, right? The six finger, uh, kind of. A, it was more of an outfielder's glove, but apparently it was an infielder's glove because it was Ozzy Smith. And in this, in the finger, the extra finger in the webbing. You know where you'd catch it. It had Ozzy Smith, like a picture of Ozzy Smith in a wizard's cape and a wand. It was awesome. That's all I have to say about that. Somebody should look that up. We need to find that mitt. It was an Ozzy Smith glove. You know what? They can look it up and then email us Jimbo Podcast Twenty One at Gmail dot com. They can email us their questions and they can go on the YouTube page as well. And they could they could comment on the YouTube page. Comment under previous episodes, previous clips. You like how I segued right there? You may that not like my wisdom, but that wisdom has just helped you segue out of that. You're that welcome. That was unbelievable. That was unbelievable. All right, let's get into today's topic. We're talking about data today. We're, there have been 134 episodes from the time we talked about data first a few years ago to now, episode 142. Episode 8 was when we talked about data the first time, and here we are now updating everything in 2023 as it pertains to data. You mentioned in the beginning of the episode there's new data and new data points that are out there, new technology that hitting coaches and hitters could use to progress. Let's talk about that new technology and if you use it and how to use it going forward. Well, the the one I've seen recently, which is really great, is the Bat Path tracer that yeah. they're using in MLB games, which yeah, unfortunately, yeah. it's not totally a lot of stuff you can find on data. Uh, I'm sorry, baseball savant, which is got just which, by the way, we did an created. episode on way uh -huh. back when as well. We did. Yeah. And, and it, it uh, most of it's pitching, right? You get a lot of pitching stats. How hard was the pitch, the spin axis, um, how much break it had, what the count was, these kind of things. But as hitters, we can look at all that information and, and, and try to try to gain an edge if we can. But um, the bat path uh, tool that they're using is really cool because it tells us, you know, if we barrel it, where is the barrel traveling to the pitch plane? So we talk a lot about the different hitting people out there. And I don't want to get Jim going because Jim Jim likes to get going. But you have um, the guy that does the farm board, which essentially is scissor. You know, you're scissoring your back foot behind you a little bit to decel your hips to clear space and let your hands come through, right? So that path, like if you would see somebody doing those drills with that bat path tool, you would see it going from like if it's a right-handed hitter, really from the inside towards second base. Right, that barrel pass moving from the inside towards second base. If you saw somebody uh, more like a judge who you know rotates a little bit harder, you're going to see that more of a circular path with his hands, where it's going to come from the inside, it's going to cover the plate, and then it's going to go left a little bit more. So what's neat is to see, you know, how how does that work for different different players? I, I put one up on, I think it was Twitter. I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, and it was I was comparing two different hitters. I don't remember who they were at this. Time. I think Judge may have been one of them, and another guy. They were both home runs that were hit like a hundred and whatever miles an hour, hundred eight miles an hour on very similar trajectories, but 
the paths were totally different. And I thought that was really cool because it spit out the same number, right? It spit out a ball that went this far, that was hit this hard, but they had two different routes to get there. You know, one ball was pulled more to left field and the other ball was hit more up the middle. So um, that that is pretty fun for me. Is everyone going to have access to that? No. Um, again, the key is trying to figure out, you know, the, the more attainable uses of technology such as blast, right? Blast is 150 bucks or diamond kinetics. That's some kind of bat sensor. And then you have some kind of uh, ball tracking system, whether it's a hit tracks or a track man or a flight scope or a Rapsodo device. They all use different technologies. They all give you a kind of different numbers. The key is to stay consistent with it. Um, a Rapsodo is going to give you kind of hotter numbers than a hit tracks for some reason. They're both different technology. One uses cameras. One uses more like radar, I believe. Um, so you got to figure that out. But they're, they're pretty close. And the launch angle stuff is is pretty much spot on. But Rapsodo does give you spin. So the total distance is going to be um, a little bit further and a little bit better. So, you know, I like to look at, the, the easiest things to look at is what is the bat doing? What is the ball doing? How much am I swinging up or down? How much is the ball going up or down? <laughs> is my barrel dropping underneath the pitch plane too much? Is it coming off the pitch plane too soon? Is my vertical bat angle too low or too high? Or more importantly, is it changing throughout the swing? Is my vertical bat angle going from a negative 40 to a negative 25? from right before contact to contact, that's a huge issue, right? Then we're going to swipe around balls. We're going to create a lot of top spin. So um, again, the technology is, and then you can have technology as, you know, blast gives you all these different metrics with the connection score and a posture and um, how fast your bat speed is and how fast your, uh, or I guess the exit velocity is something else, but we have to, we have to know what those numbers mean, first of all. And then we have to also understand where do we make contact with pitches? Was it a high pitch? You know, was it a low pitch? Was it outside? Did we hit it deep in the zone? Were we early? Because all those things matter. Um, I was doing some some of my scouting work. And, and again, these players are so good that that I get sent that their their numbers. One kid ran a 6.1660. Wow. What is he? Who is he? Justin Upton? Remember Justin Upton ran like yeah. a six point. Maybe it was BJ. One of them, though, ran yeah. like a 6.24 in the 60. Uh, well, it, it was just crazy. Stupid, I, I saw that. I went stupid to his numbers. Perfect, perfect game just to kind of see the different, you know, because I get it. I want to see what kind of is this a speed guy? Is this a power guy? Because it has their KVS thing on there and it has their their maximum exit velocity um, when they're hitting off a tee, right? So I always chuckle because whenever I look at those videos, the the stride is so big. Imagine Bryce Harper's biggest stride and then add 50% to it. And then they coil themselves as like much as possible with their front shoulder down. They throw everything into it and they swing as hard as they can and they hit a ball off the tee. And then that number 102 is posted to perfect game and the world is right. You know, I think it'd be really cool to post game numbers, have a perfect, have a perfect game showcase or have a machine throwing like, you know, 85, not even that difficult, 90 miles an hour and have their their exit velocities measured there, not off of a T. I, I understand you have to get a baseline, but we can cheat the system is what I'm saying. Okay, you can cheat the system when you're trying to just get a, a big number of exit velocity. You can hit it out in front and you can roll over and smother it with your top hand. Okay, that doesn't make you a good hitter. So if I see somebody has a great exit velocity off a T, I'm happy for you, you're strong. Okay, but the nuts and bolts of it, how does our body work so that we consistently deliver the barrel on on mistakes because that's really what hitting is all about judge has been on fire right the last week or so have you looked at the pitches that he's hitting they're cookies they're belt high fastballs belt high breaking balls right that's a good hitter that's a great hitter he's not missing his mistakes i, was gonna say, a, I may i was just going to yeah. say though that's what great hitters at the major league level do i've said this before that at the major league level in a different each plate appearance that you get, you may have two pitches at most, usually an average of like a pitch and a half to really do damage with. And the greatest hitters, you mentioned one there, the Aaron Judges of the world, the Bryce Harpers, the Juan Sotos when he's going really well, mm -hmm. the Corey Seegers, those guys don't miss those pitches. That's what separates them as elite level hitters at the highest level with the best players in the world. 
Right. And they're fine punching out if they don't get any good pitches to hit. Right? It's gonna happen. You can't hang your head. But they don't they don't foul off that pitch. So many players foul it off. Ooh, you just missed it. Hmm. No, you didn't. You you missed it. Like that was the one pitch you might have. You might only get two a game with some pitchers, right? So when Judge is getting all these, it, it drives me crazy sometimes to see that because I watch Barry Bonds. Nobody pitched to Barry Bonds. Like they walked in with the bases loaded. <laughs> That's insane because they're afraid he's going to hit a scud missile somewhere, whether it's in the park or out of the park, he's going to drive in more than one run. So to me, that's that's amazing. You know, Barry Bond, I don't know how many times he was intentionally intentionally walked. Not just walked, intentionally walked. I don't know why they don't just I don't know. I don't know why Judge gets so many good pitches to hit. He's if well, I was a pitching coach, I'd be like, hey, there's one guy in the lineup, don't let him beat us. And yet guys are, you know, giving up taters to him left and right. Like, um, I don't not that I don't like Judge. I love Judge and I love his swinging and I love I, I love watching him hit home runs, but I'm just, as a coach, I, I don't understand the process of, um, you know, but letting it's like, the best player on the team beat you. And, he does and he's it. doing that, mind you, that these pitchers, and maybe they're just, these pitchers are missing their spots. I don't know. Maybe they're missing right. badly. Yeah. Maybe they don't have to command the control. I don't know. Glasnow the other night for Seattle looked terrible. Mm -hmm. That's not the usual Tyler Glasnow we're used to. But right. maybe, to me, I don't know. I, I don't understand how, how, if you're a major league team and you're game playing against the Yankees, you're game planning against them. How do you not circle judge and say, we can't let this guy beat us with Stanton and Donaldson, both on the injured list. It doesn't really make any sense to me. Right. I do want to say this though, about Aaron judge, I, I, and him among other hitters across major league baseball, there are some that avoid all of this analysis, if you will, all of this data, and they go out there and hit, they use it, they know how to use it, know how to break it down, mm -hmm. and they know how to filter what doesn't work. Paralysis by analysis. I just heard a story recently on the Rays broadcast about Zach Eflin. He said when he was with Philadelphia, Eflin, he didn't really use much of the data that was being provided to him. But then when he came to Tampa Bay, Kyle Snyder, for those who don't know, Eflin's a right-handed pitcher. Mm -hmm. Kyle Snyder, the Rays pitching coach, was able to filter that data and make it useful for Zach Eflin for him to understand. And now he uses that data very well. And I think with players, a lot of times with all of this data, it becomes paralysis by analysis. And it goes back to coaches being able to communicate the message combined with traditional statistics, traditional mechanics, traditional ways of coaching, and blending that new 2023 data along with it. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll get... I'll get reports, you know, people send me their blast reports over, you know, whatever two month period. And they'll say, your average attack angle is this, your average bat speed is this. And I'm like, okay, like, that's great. But I would rather see video with that. So I always, all my online Academy members that use blast and I really like blast just so you all know, like if you use it properly. And if you're part of my Academy, you know, that I say, you should probably get one of those and send me blast videos, excuse me, because I want to see I, – I need to see where the pitch was. That's what Blast doesn't tell you if you just look at a report or if you look at the screen. It doesn't tell you pitch location. We don't know where that is. But if you use the Blast video to to uh, within their app, then it tells you, uh, you know, well, whatever you want to put in there. But I always look for the bat vertical angle I want. I want bat speed. I want attack angle and time to contact. So those are the four main things that I look for. I want to see that with the video of the pitch that they actually hit. And that way I can tie it together and say, oh, your attack angle looks great. It's only at 12 degrees mm -hmm. on these pitches, but they're hitting it deep in the zone. So I'm like, my gosh, if you're at 12 degrees deep in the zone, you're going to be at 20 something out in front. That's not good. But if I just see 12 on a report, I'm like, okay, that player's where they need to be. So again, you know, matching video, pitch location, pitch type. All that's really, really important. Is it front toss? Is it a machine? Is it live arm? Is it a T? Okay. All those things play a big part into uh, how we look at data and how we use it to make a player better. And when we're talking about how coaches can benefit from all of this data, how can they use all of this technology, this data, the blast? I, I With blast and all of the things that you mentioned, I'm not going to go through all of them, but all of the new systems that are used across Major League Baseball, used with high-end college, both baseball and softball programs, I hate to tell everybody, and I have experience with all of these pieces of equipment, a lot of the stuff 
they do the same thing. It's just renamed differently in some aspects. So how can coaches now benefit from the right technology that gets their hitters to where they need to be? Well, a lot of times they just they don't even use it. So, I mean, I could tell you countless college programs that have major league quality equipment and they don't even know how to access it. They don't even, yeah. Oh, look at that. Oh, you hit the ball 105 miles an hour. That was awesome. Like they, they have, they have access to all this stuff and they just use it for an entertainment value to put up on the scoreboard after somebody gets a base hit. Um, so we're honestly, if you, if you want to be successful using it, you have to use it. You have to figure it out on your own. You got to dive in. It's like a new software. It's like a new app. I don't know how to do this. Well, Hands on, buddy. Get in there and get your hands dirty and and kind of figure it out. So that's why my certification program is so popular is because, you know, I I experience or as Jim would say, wisdom. Right. You know, I have this I can share it with you and and whittle it down into something manageable for you, you know, so you don't have to spend 20 years. But if you're out there on your own, you got to just dive into it and see if it works. You know what works for you? Um, I have an instructor that just that I've trained before and he just, you know, bought a blast sensor to use with his lessons and stuff. And he's, and I told him the same thing. You just got to use it. You know, you got to use it. You got to look, you know, check your contact points, check the numbers. These are the numbers to look at, you know, um, how fast was the pitch? Okay. And then he'll send me stuff and bounce ideas off me. And that's how you learn. Um, You can't just like read a book on um, what data works for you. You know, the Rapsodo is great for me. I love it. I'm going to test the new model out on Monday, hopefully. Um, but the spin rate, you know, the spin rate off the bat, everybody loves the spin rate. You know, again, hitting is reactive, right? We're reacting to what the pitcher's doing. The pitcher's in control. The pr- pitcher can put more pressure on certain fingers, um, hold the ball a different way to to change the spin. As hitters, we're trying to create consistent spin. Um that doesn't, we don't want too much spin, either too much backspin, and we don't want really any top spin um, if we can help it because that um, makes the ball travel travel less. So the Rapsodo is a great device, but it's very confusing and it gives you such so many data points and information that then there's a little gyro on there spinning around, kind of telling you, well, gyro is different than true spin, right? And then you're like, oh my gosh, what's the true spin? What is this, you know, 12 o'clock? you know, spin rate is one o'clock. Like, what does this, what does this mean? And, and honestly, the only way to do it is either you, you know, you sit down next to the, the rep, Mr. Rap Soto, and they explain it to you as you're, as you're doing it, or you just get in the cage and figure it out and you watch it. So I love watching, okay, that ball came off the bat. It looked like this when I saw it, right? I saw it go into right center field. Now, how does that relate to what the Rap Soto told me? And then it's like, okay, well, it definitely only had a little bit of side spin. Yeah, it said it only had eight feet of side spin. Okay, that's really good. Now, what was that spin rate? Okay, well, it was only at 1,200. Oh, that's good. You know, 1,200 kind of back spin, side spin is, is a good number. So, again, you got to dive in. You got to have fun. You got to have time to do it. Um, or you got to talk to people that have already been through the process and hope that they share their information with you. I've used my hands a lot in today's episode, by the way, I've noticed. I'm going to go back and I'm going to rewatch and I'm going to notice like my hands like going all over the place. Real, real Italian today. That's good. Yeah. yeah. Forget about it, Jimmy. Can you do that again for me? Nope. Don't do it again. So (laughs) did I, um, did I, (laughs) hey, by the way, Denver, man, I got to tell you, I was thinking about you, um. We're recording this on a Friday. I was thinking about you yesterday when watching the NBA Finals. Last year, the av- well, what? The Avalanche in 2022. This yeah. year, the Nuggets. Denver's on quite a Yeah, you better, better watch out there. for the Rockies in 20. Oh, I years. wasn't alluding to them. I was saying more of maybe like the Broncos this year. Oh, man. The Nuggets, are really, the Nuggets are like the epitome of a team. That's why I like watching them. I like watching them play. You said like, that. Well, you said the same thing last year about the Avalanche, no, but and did you, you didn't watch, name one player on the Avalanche. I can name you, four players on the Avalanche. If you this watch, year. I know I only watch playoffs, but if you watch, no, it was it's so like my dad. That's I my watch, dad. Does. He's like, I love playoff hockey. Well, what about regular season? Nah, playoff hockey's playoff better. Hockey. Well, we, got, well, we got lightning too. season tickets, Chief. I mean, don't you want to know? I don't need to know who's on the team. Yeah. Okay, that's okay. I don't have time don't for that. Deal. Yeah. But they they play like Joker's an assist machine, man. Like his name's not Joker. His name's Jokic. It's the Joker, man. It's the Joker. Anyway, he's you're not a real fan. You can't be saying you can't be calling him by his nickname. You only watch the playoffs. Yeah, that's that's all right. He's the Joker. 
But what I found really interesting with the Nuggets is even though the Nuggets, um, you know, played played the Heat last night, they were they still broke uh, coverage and went and looked at what LeBron James was doing walking into the uh, tunnel. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah, always. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, that was for all my Denver people that are out there. Didn't you see that when the Nuggets beat the crap out of the Lakers, and instead of showing the the Nuggets celebrate after the final. Uh, whatever the final second ran off, all they did was have uh video cameras following LeBron into the clubhouse, and then the other Lakers players didn't even care about the bro- uh, on the, the Nuggets. So, yeah, the Nuggets got a little chip on their shoulder. I like it. Uh, I mean, they should win the series, they're playing the eighth seed. The Heat are good, and they've got the best coach in basketball, but they're playing the eighth seed. I mean, come on, give me a break. The eighth seed had to beat a couple other pretty good seeds. <laughs> Okay. All right. You got everything else on um, data the today, episode 142? The the best. They swept them. <laughs> Do you have anything else on episode uh, 142 data? Mm. Or did no. we touch on everything today? We did touch on everything today. We doing I miss Kobe basketball. Bryant. I miss Kobe. That's I who I too. miss. That guy was something special. Now that we're on basketball, I was thinking about this morning, Allen Iverson. Remember him? Remember Allen Iverson? How great he was. Yeah, he was great, but he wasn't like Kobe was a good. Kobe was one of the best of all like time. Some say Kobe that... was better is or is better than LeBron or was better than LeBron. He just was like a, but he was a, I don't know. He was a He's good a killer. clubhouse guy. I'm not real sure LeBron's the best clubhouse guy. Maybe well, he I don't is, know about Kobe though, because some have said that his teammates hated him. Because he was tough on him. Yeah, he, he was. was like the true leader. He didn't. I was up... like Jake Epstein in the clubhouse in the oh, professional yeah. ranks. Everybody's friend. Everybody's friend. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, you were, just, you were uh, the politician as, in the clubhouse, weren't as, you? As right. far as data is concerned, uh, data can be a great resource if you use the right way. So um, definitely embrace it. Definitely use it. Uh, if you're a parent or or just a coach, you know, don't go, you know, spend a ton of money on it. But you could start with something like a blast. Um, or diamond kinetics or something very basic like that just to get some you know i mean i will say that if you just go get a blast and then you don't send me video then you're just going to look at your blast data and you're never going to change so you have to if you're going to use information if you're going to use data you're going to use technology you better have someone that can fix what the problem is because you're going to find a problem in there and then in what is the process of fixing that problem so make sure you have a solution before you find out what your problem is all right well great episode this week great information next week episode 143 we'll be doing volume i think it's volume two of facing an ace and we'll be breaking down santi alcantara marlin's right hander he is a phenomenal pitcher a tremendous tremendous talent And we will be discussing how hitters can go about game planning against an ace like that. Hence the name facing an ace volume. I think it's volume two, Sandy Alcantara. Yeah. The best way. That's how you say his name, by the way, not Sandy Alcantara. It's Sandy, Sandy Alcantara. Oh, very nice, Jim. The best way here's here's, my homework. I'll leave you with with this. The best way to face an ace. Your hammy is a little tight that day. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. My shoulder. Sure. Should be ready tomorrow. Should be ready tomorrow, Skipper. But today, I'm, yeah. I'm just feeling a little tight. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's next week, episode 143. Go back in the archives, listen to previous episodes. Uh, we just did a mechanical breakdown on Jeff McNeil. So go back in the archives, listen to that. Later in the year, we'll be breaking down the swing of Hank Aaron. That'll be a lot of fun. Some other cool topics, too. Follow us on social media at Jim Tara, at Epstein Hitting, both Twitter and Instagram. Email us your questions, Jimbo Podcast 21 at gmail.com. And if they're good questions, then we will talk about them and and read them right here on the podcast. And by the way, if you want to be a sponsor of the podcast, then please reach out Jimbo podcast 21 at gmail.com. We are on nine different platforms, audio and visual. So there's some stuff, information there for you. So um, email us Jimbo podcast 21 at gmail.com. If you do want to be a sponsor of the show, or if you have any questions as well. All right. You got anything else or are we done? We good. We're good. Let's wrap it. All Gucci. All right. Thank you for watching, listening, subscribe to the show, Apple, Google, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast and on YouTube, watch the show, the lab Epstein hitting podcast, YouTube page, and we will talk to you next week.